Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. The Hell of Molly's Early Childhood It seemed never to be forgotten. God forbid you let something like that into your own life. I'd rather throw myself in a noose or off a bridge into a river. And psychologists also say, making a smart face, that every man gets what he deserves. Was Molly born worthy of a life like this? Bullshit. They also say that a man makes his own destiny. And if you're humiliated, it means you let yourself be humiliated and bullied. And they say many other things without even trying to understand the situation. Talking with your tongue is not like unloading railroad cars. Molly. Once I tried to turn to such a specialist, but after the first visit to the psychologist's office I realized that this is not her version of solving the problem. Look at these squares and choose the one you like. Molly was asked by a woman with glasses, the psychologist, who was recommended to the girl by Molly's work colleague, reached for the green square and took this one in her hand. And why did you choose the color green? Asked the woman, looking intently at her clientele. Molly did not know what to answer to this question. She chose it without thinking. Molly liked green in general. It's a warm color associated with a sense of freedom. It's the color of grass in a field. The color of the long-awaited spring of hope for happiness. It was in spring that Molly and Stephen had their daughter. All through their pregnancy, the newlyweds didn't know who was to be born. One May Day, but the husband was sure of a son. It seemed that he did not even allow the idea that in addition to boys are born and girls. And Molly didn't care as long as he was healthy. She planned to have more children. There should be at least two children in a family, and preferably three or four. Molly herself once had a brother, but now she knows nothing about him. Molly's mother took her youngest son far away. Where is he now? She didn't know. Come here, bitch. I'll kill you. The father yelled at the whole house. Sam came home again at zero o'clock, drunk as a skunk. He started screaming from the doorstep. Six-year-old Molly woke up, covered her head with a blanket to hide next to her in the crib crying one-year-old Robert. Mom jumped up, ran to her father. He demanded his shoes off, lying on the hallway floor, unable to get to his feet. The woman urged him not to shout. The children were asleep, but the father wouldn't stop. What are you afraid of? The fool did not wait for her husband and should wait like a faithful dog under the door. Molly's mom dragged her drunken husband on herself to the bedroom, and he continued to swear, barely dragging his feet. Hush, hush, whispered mom. You'll go to bed now. You'll rest when you sleep. You're tired from work. I'm tired, I earn money. And you're sitting at home, you little goats. Yes, yes, you're good, you earn money. The woman tried to calm down her father. He suddenly stopped, stretched like a string, and looked at her with an angry look. You are not enough. I don't earn enough. I feed you freeloaders. You're sitting on my neck. There was a bang. Father hit his wife in the face, and when she fell to the floor and kicked her, he collapsed on the bed, and in a minute fixed it. Good, at least he didn't hit mom for long today, Molly thought. The girl got up from the bed, gave Robert a pacifier to calm him down. She turned her brother on his side, stroked his back. The boy stopped crying. The mother entered the room, covering her face with one hand. Lie down, Molly fell asleep. Your daddy will not wake up until morning now. The woman lay down with her daughter, put her arm around her and falling asleep, the girl heard her mother quietly sodding howls. In the morning, the mother fussed in the kitchen preparing breakfast for her husband. Molly looked out, and a little at opening the door, her father in sweatpants and a t-shirt, holding his head, walking down the hallway from the bathroom. The girl quickly shut the door. It wasn't time to go out yet. We have to wait until daddy goes to work, or he'll cuss again about getting in the way. Molly didn't even have to peek. She knew that now her mother would put food on his plate and put half a glass of vodka for her father to drink. She herself would pack her husband's lunch in a plastic container, so that at work he would eat, and he would drink in one gulp from the glass, 
cry out in relief, put his fist to his nose and sigh greedily. Robert woke up and stood in the crib. Molly got him, sat him up, and began to remove the boy's pajamas. Then she pulled a clean t-shirt and pants out of the closet. She put socks on his feet. Here you are my beautiful, clean, sleep little one, she said to her brother. Came alive, curly, dark hair. Mommy. Little man said, pointing to the door. That mom. And you and I are going to sit here for a while. She had already put a plush venison in his hands. We'll play here, and then daddy will go to work. And then we'll go to mommy's. When the front door slammed, Molly took her father's hand and led him into the kitchen. Mommy was making porridge. When the woman turned to the children, the girl saw a huge bruise on her face and a swollen eye. Sit down and sit down, mom said herself. I'll feed them now. She put plates in front of the children, put oatmeal porridge, poured tea for Molly, and heated milk for her brother. If you're home today, I won't take you to the garden, she said quietly to her daughter. Molly didn't even bother to ask. Why would she have to stay home? She understood that her mother would not go out with such a face. She would not show it to people. She was ashamed of what her husband was doing. She hid everything from acquaintances and neighbors. Only grandmother Clara knew how hard it was for her daughter to live with a drunkard husband. Slaga stopped by on her way to the post office. When she saw her daughter's face, she sighed and sat down on a stool and started again. Has he gone completely off the rails? Goddamn Herod. Molly wanted cookies. Grandma Clara never came empty-handed. She'd bring the kids candy or chocolate-covered buns. What for this time? Or are you gonna say you backed yourself into a corner again? I won't. Mom sadly answered the woman. My strength is already gone, and I'm telling you for the one thousandth time to run away from him. Where am I going to run to? Guys, where am I going to put this on? Grab the kids, run, or he'll kill you, you drunkard. Molly's mom was looking out the window, tears dripped from her eyes. She cried from pity for herself and her children, from hopelessness, from the injustice of life. She never did anything bad about her husband, took care of two children, gave birth to a good hostess, and he was not a day sober and even cried. She even called the police once. She was afraid he'd really kill her and the kids. They took her husband to the station, and when he came back, he beat her even worse. Molly's father was a tough man, worked at the motor pool as a mechanic, made a good living. There was always food in the house. Mom dressed the kids well. On the day of a paycheck or advance payment, her father would put a wad of bills on the kitchen table for expenses and leave a part of it in his pocket. For the groceries, you buy something there was going to paper, boots or something. And don't forget to pay the rent. My father never made my mother to report where she spent the money. And she sometimes built something to put away in the stash, saved on himself that you go like a scarecrow vegetable garden. Once said the husband to his wife, I give you not enough money, or what, I give you. Buy yourself some new clothes or go to the hairdresser. Grandma, are you in the end or not? I'll go, I'll go. The woman agreed with him. She knew that by evening he would forget about his words, would not even ask if she bought herself a new outfit. And she could save money to buy something for the kids. On weekends, her father would get hungover in the morning and be kind. On such days he showed attention to his daughter and little son, played with them. Dad used to carry Robert on his back, laughing, pretending to be a horse, crawling on all fours across the floor. Molly laughed. How funny. It was working out for him. While Mom was putting things in order, he led the children into the yard. There the men would gather around the table in the shade of the dew and birch trees. They'd play cards or dominoes and someone would bring out a bottle. By the end of the day, my father would be drunk again, and it was good if he fell asleep on a bench under a tree. Then mom would take the kids home, and Molly was glad her father didn't fight. Grandma Clara scolded her mother every time, saying that she would wait for her father to kill her. But she just cried quietly. Yes, he's sick, mom. You know, the woman said, alcoholism is a disease. Yes, 
And you think manhandling is a disease too? Why don't we go find a doctor to take his fists off? I don't care if he drinks all the vodka in the world. Why is he hitting? He's out of control. He doesn't know what he's doing at times like this. But he's a good man, and he loves his kids and brings money. Aha, shook her head grandmother Molly. And then for every bill he paints your face. Get away from him. I'm telling you again, it won't end well. Where would I go? Can't you hide in your house? He'll find you and bring you back. He'll be more angry than ever. I don't care if I go to the end of the world. You can't live like this. You're still young. You won't be able to leave the house for a week again. Where would you go with such a lantern under your eye? There was no one to stand up for Molly's mom. She didn't complain. She just put up with it. Every time she thought her husband would make it up to her. But the hunchbacked man can't help himself. That terrible day. Six-year-old Molly remembered for the rest of her life. She and her mom were coming home from the store. Molly, holding Robert's hand, was leading her brother up the stairs. Mommy was dragging the stroller up to the third floor. The girl made for the door, led her brother into the apartment. Molly's mother came in, took off her jacket, boots and hat, and hung it on the coat rack. She was about to undress Robert. The father came out of the room. He was staggering, holding his hand to the wall. The man yelled, I'm here, and there's nothing to eat. I'm here, and there's nothing to eat. Now I'll feed you. Mother did not undress, hurried into the kitchen, and her father followed her. She poured soup from the pot on the stove, put it on the table next to the plate, and put a spoon. Father looked at the food with a wild look. What kind of ballad is this? He swung at the woman, and she pressed her back against the refrigerator. Are you going to eat that yourself now? You bitch. Dad grabbed the plate and poured it on Mom. You like it, he hissed at her. And then he punched her in the face. Don't, don't hit. And the kids will see. The woman tried to cover her face with her hands. But that only made the drunken husband even angrier. He started beating her messiah like a punching bag. Falling to the floor, she tried to crawl out of the kitchen. But the foot in the boot reached her and beat her on the sides of her stomach back. Suddenly, the father stopped angrily, looked at his wife, and grabbed the knife she had just used to cut the bread. He brought the knife over his wife. The woman huffed and jumped to her feet, and grabbing Robert, rushed to the door. Molly scrambled into a corner, closed his eyes with a drunken gait. Dad followed Mom with a knife in his hands. A door slammed, and then a rumbling sound was heard. Molly opened her eyes and saw her father fall to the floor in the hallway lying on the floor. He had caught hold of some clothes that were hanging in the wall of the slide. That did not resist and fell on the man. At the noise and rumble, neighbors ran into the apartment. Molly saw them lifting the heavy closet, trying to free her father, watched as a neighbor shook him, and then saw a dark rivulet spread out, her father's head dangling across the hallway floor murdered, said the neighbor. That's it, said her husband dead, calling the police. Molly watched as a man in a police uniform entered the apartment, as they then covered the grain from the couch, motionless. The father's body was carried out of the house in a pool of blood on the floor. The girl sat in the corner until she came running. The panting grandmother. Spoons. Molly imprinted she, examining her granddaughter. You are unharmed. You were not touched by this idiot, my little girl. Molly snuggled against her grandmother's warm body. The woman hugged her, kissed her forehead. Is there a God in the white world spared you from torment? Said grandmother, looking her granddaughter on the head. Not for nothing, they say. No matter how much you twist the rope, there will be an end. Clara dressed Molly and took her home. Grandma, where is mom? Asked the girl on the way. Who knows? replied Klaga. The neighbors only saw how she ran across the yard with Robert in her arms, hid somewhere, probably. Good thing she got away in time, or your daddy would have killed her, and all the guilt, damn it. He was a good man once. Grandma read all the way through. That day Molly clearly learned the greatest evil in life is alcohol. If your father hadn't drunk that damn vodka, 
We would have lived like all normal people in peace and harmony, but he was always reaching for the bottle. Have mercy on the soul of your servant. God, mumbled Clara. He lived like a drunkard, and he couldn't die properly. You, Molly, stay away from drunks. They're not people. They're beasts with a terrible beast inside. Molly didn't understand what kind of beast was inside her father. She was afraid of people who drank more than anything else in her life. She began to live with her grandmother, and she said every chance she got, wine is evil. There's nothing good in a bottle, only trouble. That's why when the girl introduced her fiancé to Slaga, the first thing she asked was if you drink. No way, grandma. He doesn't take a drop in his mouth. Never, ever, ever, said Molly, not letting Stephen answer and he confirmed her words by nodding his head. A few months after Molly's mom disappeared, Grandma received a letter on an envelope. There was no return address, but the handwriting the letter was signed with was something she knew well. The daughter had sent word. The woman didn't print the letter right away. She opened it only when she got home. She slowly undressed and sat down at the table in the kitchen. The envelope contained one piece of paper and a photograph. The picture was of a father, mother and children with a half-year-old Robert sitting on Molly's mother's lap being held by a smiling Molly. When the picture had been taken, Clara didn't know. She had never seen it. The woman put the picture aside and picked up the sheet. Don't look for me or think of me. Mother, please just please raise Molly. Take good care of her. Also let her remember that I love her and that she has a brother, your daughter. Clara ran her eyes over those skimpy lines several times, as if trying to learn something else from them besides what was written. The daughter had run away from the husband who had made her life a living hell. It's even scary to think what would have happened to her children if on the day when that violent drunkard raised a knife at her, she hadn't managed to escape, but she managed to run away, grabbing her son. She was afraid to go back for her daughter. Where's your daughter with you? not knowing that your man is dead and you can live in peace, thought Clara, looking out the window. There was her granddaughter playing with other girls who would now have to be brought up. She knew she could do it, but she could hardly replace the child's mother. Now the woman finally realized that her daughter would not come back. Molly did not cause her grandmother any problems. She grew up an obedient girl, helped as much as she could around the house. She studied diligently at school, but she was not an excellent student. It was not particularly given to her studies. But Molly loved to draw. Her grandmother did not buy, bought her pencils, felt tip pens, paints and brushes. She liked to watch her granddaughter's creativity. Sometimes, they took out a photo card together. The message in the letter from mom was being looked at. Molly never forgot her brother. In her drawing, she often depicted herself next to him as well as her mother in a beautiful dress, in polka dots, and her grandmother. But she did not draw her father. The subject of her dad's death was very unpleasant to her. Sometimes, she would break up her old man's grumbling into a long monologue about how drunks are subhumans and should stay away from them. After graduation, Molly learned to be an active designer, got a job as a mannequin in her client's salon. In line lined up, because they knew such drawings on the nails nowhere else will not meet. Molly brought out any ornaments, flowers of animals made fashionable and stylish French. To her in advance recorded and young girls, and ladies of venerable age. Very quickly the girl became independent. She began to earn good money. Grandmother rejoiced. Her granddaughter now takes care of her all the time. Returning from work in the evening, Molly always went to the confectionery to buy her grandmother some dessert. On holidays, she always gave her gifts. I am a senior citizen, glad for the years she raised and educated Molly. She had no time for herself. She pulled the girl on her pension and the money she got from the tenants. On the advice of a neighbor, she rented out her daughter and her husband's apartment. At least some money to supplement her pension. And Molly, even after she became independent and began to earn money, was not going to leave her grandmother. So they lived together until Molly met Stephen. It happened at a friend's wedding. Nancy worked with Molly in the same salon.
The girls immediately became friends and over time even began to confide in each other women's secrets. True, in the life of Molly, and there were no special secrets, home grandmother, work, but Nancy's life was going strong. The pretty hairdresser was a hot commodity with guys who followed her around in her herds, and the girl took advantage of them. She'd go out with one or the other. After tales, he has a nice car, he's always got money. He takes me to cafes and treats me. And Christopher's smart. He's interesting. She told Nancy about the guys she'd been seeing at the same time. And if one of them finds out that you're messing around with both of them, Molly asked, but he finds out. So what? I'll still have the other one. My friend laughed, and it was as if she was in the water, wasn't it? One day, Kevin was waiting for Nancy at the salon door. He stood leaning against the hood of his foreign car with a bouquet of flowers and waited patiently. Where are you going today? Molly asked her friend at the mirror. I do not know. Maybe to a restaurant or maybe somewhere else. As long as everywhere the doors are open. Wherever I want to go, that's where I'll go. You sure you made a date with Kevin tonight, not Solovki? You sure I'm stupid or something? I have Christopher on odd numbers. And what's our date on even numbers today? The girl broke away from her image in the mirror and pointed to the calendar sitting on the wall. That's right, 22. So that's how many in walking. They mixed it up. Molly persisted. Yes, that something is attached, waved away her friend. Nothing, it's just that there's a guy looking at our windows nearby. And he reminds me very much of your Christopher. Molly nodded at the young man who stood with a bouquet of chrysanthemums under a tree opposite the entrance to the salon. Nancy darted to the window. Oh shit, where the hell did you come from? She sensed so that none of the boys noticed her. Nancy ran up to Molly Morozenko. Honey, go distract Christopher, take him around the corner so I can get away. My friend folded her palms in front of her, begging Molly for help. Well, no, you're not getting me into your intrigues. Molly refused. What am I gonna tell him? How am I gonna lead him around the corner? Are you out of your mind? Nancy sighed heavily. There's no way out. She'd have to do something. And she headed for the exit. And Molly stared out the window, wondering what was going to happen next. What Nancy was saying to her suitors, she couldn't hear. She could only guess. But I could see Kevin pulling her friend's hand toward him and Christopher tossing the bouquet on the ground at Nancy's feet. Then Kevin and Molly got in the car and drove off. Good thing it didn't come to a fight. The situation was resolved in Kevin's favor. A few weeks later, Nancy announced to her friend that they had applied and would soon be married. Molly, of course, was among the invitees. With Kevin, I will be like a cheese in butter, said the friend. He has a lot of money and he doesn't refuse to spend it on me and among his friends he's also looking for someone. You'll get married like me and you'll be fine. Molly was fine as she was. She didn't want to get married. She thought she had time for it. She lived well with her grandmother. She had doubts about finding a man worthy of her father. Molly well remembered how he beat her mother, drunk on vodka, to the point of madness. But at the wedding of a friend, Molly still met her future spouse. It was a friend of the groom's. Meet Kevin. Kevin introduced his buddy to the girl. This is Stephen. Molly, she replied smiling at the handsome guy. And you probably know everyone here already. Stephen asked. You know, absolutely no one. Except that I just met you. And I don't know anyone here except the bride and groom. So I suggest we stick together. I agree. At the restaurant, they sat side by side. Stephen turned out to be very gallant, courting, freezing. The girl immediately said she only drinks mineral water or juice. I don't drink either, Stephen said. Not at all. What a good boy you are, Molly rejoiced. I don't like drunks. Neither do I. But tell me, what good is it when a man drinks? There are a lot of interesting things in the world. And he drowns his life in a glass. That's right. I think so too. Molly liked the guy more and more. He asked her to dance, and she noted that he moved pretty well. The wedding was fun. When the guests started to leave, Stephen offered to walk Molly out. 
Do you live far away? He asked. But the girl did not even have time to answer anything as he said. Yes, it is in principle. Anyway, the weather is good. We'll walk. Actually, it's a bit far. I wanted to take a cab to my house, trying to dissuade the guy from walking Molly. But he had already taken her under the elbow and led her down the street. The weather's nice. We can walk. Why pay money for a cab? You could walk halfway around the world in such good company. The words that Stephen was pleased to walk with her flattered Molly no end. And the compliment. Except her legs were bugging. She wasn't used to walking in high heels for so long. After walking halfway, Molly asked Stephen, Let's sit on a bench. A lot of people are tired. They sat down. There were stars in the sky, but the little girl did not want to admire them. She wanted more than anything to be in her bed and stretch her legs. But after five minutes, Stephen got up and held out his hand to her. Come on. They walked slowly down the street toward the engine house, saying goodbye to Molly in the driveway. Stephen asked for her phone number. Maybe I'll call you. Take a walk sometime tonight. It wasn't Molly's policy to give out her number to anyone, but now she didn't think it was worth it. The girl quickly dictated the phone number and disappeared into the entryway. Going up to her floor, she felt that her legs were showing at least on her knees on the stairs crawled. Friday, Stephen called her. I have tomorrow off. I want to go for a walk in the park. What do you think about it? He asked. Why not? Let's meet at what time? Let's meet at the main entrance at six. Okay, I'll be there. I'll be waiting. Don't be late. The guy talked to her like an old friend, like they'd known each other for a long time. It seemed a little strange to her, but Molly banished the doubt, thinking that she had gone completely feral. She doesn't date guys and doesn't know how young people socialize nowadays. Who called? Nancy swept up Paul after leaving a client whose haircut she had just given. Molly Stephen said vaguely, you guessed it. He asked me out tomorrow. Wow. I guess he likes you. My friend smiled. Yeah. He liked me so much he walked me across town in heels yesterday after the wedding. You could have called a cab. Come on, Stephen. He's a nice guy. He just wanted to be with you, I guess. Tell me about him. What does he do? Where does he work? Molly decided she had to know something about him before she went on a date. And she was sure she would. Stephen had asked her out on a date. I don't know exactly, Nancy said, setting aside the long-handled brush she used to sweep the floor. I know he's a manager in some company, that he's always got money. Lides with his mother, I think. Not married. Why? Why what? Didn't understand the question. Nancy, why not married? He looks about 30. He should be married by now. Well, that's for each man to decide for himself. Maybe he just hasn't met the one and only Nancy raised her eyes to the ceiling and then stared at Molly with a believing look. And you, friend, don't fidget. For once a guy's paying attention to you, you have to charm him. And to celebrate, I can give you the best haircut ever. Thanks, Nancy. Don't. Molly seemed unnecessary, especially for Stephen. I'll just go for a walk. Maybe sit in a cafe or go on a ride. A special hairdo is inappropriate here. The next day, Molly was going out with Stephen. She was applying her makeup in front of the mirror when Clara walked into the room. Where are you going, Molly? Grandma asked. Yes, to the park. And with whom, if it's no secret? Not really. The old lady was curious. No. Nancy, now a married woman from work, runs home and spends weekends with her husband. Who else would she be with? Molly didn't usually go out with anyone else, so she couldn't wait to get an answer with a guy. Name's Stephen. I met him at Nancy's wedding. He's a friend of her husband's. Molly turned to her grandmother and asked her out. He's a nice guy. Still curiosity got the best of her. Seemed normal. What could Molly tell about Stephen if she would only see him for the second time today? The girl painted her lips moved a little away from the mirror, looked at how the dress fit. On the whole, the image suited her. What a beauty you are. Granddaughter, said Clara, 
It's a pity your mother can't see you. She'd be happy. She loved you very much. Grandma, why are you talking about her in the past tense? Who knows? I'm just used to her not being around. And probably never will be. Why didn't she come running to me then? Why didn't she seek protection from the police? She'd be living with us now. And Robert too. Now, how can you find them in a world this big? You and I both know she was afraid of her father. I just want to believe that she's alive, and that her brother's alive, and that they're all right. God willing, God willing, I shook my head. Every day, all these years she prayed to God that her daughter would give news of herself. But there had been no tidings. But I'll give you a kiss before you go. The boy's probably waiting for you. As Molly approached the main entrance of the park, she caught sight of Stephen. To her surprise, he was dressed plainly, not flashy. And she was already confused. She put on her best dress. He'd spent an hour working on her hair. And Molly expected Stephen to come to the meeting with flowers. And she and Nancy Kevin are friends. The girl was used to the fact that her friend Suter always showed up with a bouquet and his friend didn't consider it necessary to buy flowers on the way. It was kind of a weird residue on my soul, but Molly chased it away. And the unpleasant thoughts. What's the big deal about no flowers? After all, it's just a walk between two people who don't know each other, she thought. There were many people in the park on a Saturday afternoon. Parents were walking with their children, queuing at the ticket office to buy tickets for the rides. There were pensioners and couples sitting on benches. Stephen and Molly were spanking. It had been so long since I'd been to an amusement park. Almost nowhere to go. No fun. The girl told me. So that's normal with the way we live. Work is home. It's not about fun, Stephen replied. What do you think happiness is? Molly decided to ask this difficult question, thinking that now we'll hear a long reasoning story in the stability of life answered the lad. And Molly looked at him in surprise. What do you mean? You see, Molly, when a man has everything, and he does not need anything, he can feel happy. A nice apartment, a family, a wife and kids, a financial safety cushion. But it's saving for a rainy day. To make sure that tomorrow your family and loved ones won't go around the world with their hand out. Then I can tell you're not entirely happy. Why not? I am. But you're not married, and you talk about family as part of what should make a man happy. Stephen laughed. I suppose you're right. I lack a wife and a family to make me happy. But that's fixable, isn't it? He looked at Molly questioningly, and she was suddenly confused, not knowing what to say. I guess. Why don't we go on an amusement ride? I haven't been on a ride in 100 years. The girl suggested it. You're like a little kid. Let's just walk around and talk. So we'll go on a merry-go-round with you, next to five-year-old children. Molly sighed. She wanted to sit down, but the benches along the alley were occupied. They already were. They'd already circled the park for the fifth time. Stephen was an interesting conversationalist, but Molly wanted to rest ahead in the shade of the trees. She saw a small summer cafe. Come and have a coffee. She pointed with her hand at Stephen's table. Without much enthusiasm, he followed in the direction Molly pointed. It was obvious that his plans did not include sitting in a cafe. What shall we order? Molly asked. When the girl in the black skirt and white shirt brought the menu, also wanted only coffee, Stephen stretched out. I'm hungry. Why don't we eat something? Molly noticed that her bow tensed reading the menu as if he was counting something making complex mathematical calculations. I'll have a salad, fish steak, and ice cream. He looked at her, then back at the menu. And I'll have ice cream and coffee, please, the guy said. Waitresses, waiting for Molly's order, looking around, the place seemed very cozy to her. Nearby was a small pond in which ducks swam. The crowns of trees were reflected in the water. The girl watched the boy and his mother feeding the birds, throwing pieces of bun into the pond. She mentally went back to her childhood. Her grandmother used to bring her here, and they used to feed the floating birds too. Only they'd thrown regular cookies into the water. The food at the cafe was delicious. 
Satisfied and fed up, Molly sought coffee. She waited for further suggestions from Stephen, but he was thoughtful. When the waitress brought the bill, the guy took his wallet out of his pocket. Oh, I'm a fool. He said, looking in his wallet, I forgot the money. I've only got enough for ice cream and coffee. Molly thought he was embarrassed in front of her. She hastened to reassure her beau. You're upset, aren't you? Who wouldn't be? I have money with me. I'll pay you back. She took out her purse and paid the bill. On their way back from the walk, Stephen started talking about how it was too wasteful to eat in cafes. It was much cheaper and healthier to cook at home. Molly took these words as a call to action. You know, I'm not a bad cook. I could take you out to dinner. Stephen nodded his head a moment, then said, A good hostess must know how to cook. At the same time, she will not buy expensive products, but will be able to set the table from the minimum. Can you do that? I guess, but it's better to have all the right ingredients for a meal. Then I want you to invite me to visit, smiled Stephen. But Ivanovo did not follow any time soon. Stephen disappeared somewhere, did not call, and did not appear. Maybe he didn't like me, Molly thought. She asked Nancy to ask her husband where Stephen had gone. He's got a crush on you after all. She laughed, squinted slyly at her friend. I just liked him. Besides, we said we'd have dinner at my place. I'd already thought of what I'd cook. And he suddenly disappeared. All right, I'll find out, Nancy promised. But Stephen showed up as suddenly as he disappeared. He called Molly in the evening, said he'd been very busy with a lot of things to do. The guy apologized and asked if her offer to invite him to visit was still valid. Of course, rejoiced the girl. When is it convenient for you? Let's make it a weekend. Molly mentally began to prepare for a new meeting. She wondered what her grandmother would say about the guy. Would she approve? That her granddaughter had a beau. What if she didn't like him? On the appointed day, Molly was in the kitchen preparing for dinner. She and her grandmother covered the table with a snow-white tablecloth, which was only taken out on special occasions. The girl left the cutlery, and Clara kept an eye on the peach pie that was allowed in the oven. Stephen looked respectable. He was wearing a handsome suit, as if fresh from the store, and holding a bouquet of roses, which he handed to Molly's grandmother. Very glad to meet you, he shook hands with her. Molly escorted the guy to the table. She was a little worried. She and her grandmother hardly ever had men in their house, and here was a young handsome guy, with whom a girl would start something more than just friendship. Stephen looked with satisfaction at the dishes as if by magic, appearing on the table very beautifully. And it must be delicious too, he asked Molly. And you try it, don't be shy. Molly offered the guest, a salad, an appetizer, a hot dish. We also have a pie with peaches for tea treats. Grandma was there, pulled a bottle of cash out of the cupboard. It looks like the groom's coming. We should buy him a drink. But Stephen made a warning gesture. I don't drink, he said, when he saw that Clara had put the liquor on the table. Not at all, asked the pensioner, not at all. Alcohol is the greatest evil that can be in life. Why waste your money and your life on it? That's good. That's right, young man, Clara said approvingly, hiding the bottle back in the cupboard. The dinner passed in a good-spirited atmosphere. Stephen talked a little about himself. He asked Molly's grandmother more about their life. We live like most people, she said. I raised the car alone. She's been through a lot, but she's been a good girl. My granddaughter is a hard worker. She's not frugal, and she's appreciated at work. As soon as Molly started working, it was much easier for us. When the girl went to the kitchen to make tea and treat Stephen with a cake of her own making, she asked the guy in a conspiratorial tone of voice, what are your intentions with Molly? Serious. He was not at all embarrassed by the question asked straight to the forehead. Stephen looked confident and calm. Molly is a wonderful girl. I'd marry her. He thought for a moment and continued, you know, Clara, it's hard to find a good wife these days. Girls want to go to bars and restaurants to have fun, to visit beauty salons. They buy things for themselves as if it's their last day. 
and more often than one twice one dress does not wear. All this makes chaos and confusion in family life. I want stability. I want everything in the house. I want my children to grow up. So Mary Molly, the woman smiled and guessing, and she's my no frills, modest, good earner. At work, she is appreciated by her clients in advance in line to her. Very much Clara wanted to understand great grandchildren and to go to the other world knowing that none of her cars will remain. And Stephen thoughtfully said, and maybe I'll get married. After dinner, they said goodbye. Molly thought Stephen would invite her for a walk, but he said he had a lot to do tomorrow morning. So he needed a good night's sleep. And two months later, Molly and Stephen applied for a marriage license. How did it happen? Molly didn't understand. It was as if she was asleep and dreamed about proposing to a girl. Stephen did not even bring flowers, but Molly did not pay much attention to it. The main thing he said was, I want you to be my wife. Isn't that the kind of words every young girl dreams of? Grandmother rejoiced. Well, shall we get ready for the wedding? I have some savings. A little, but I'll help as much as I can with readiness to participate in the celebration, and enthusiastically took the news pensioner. We won't do the wedding, Stephen said firmly. It would be wasteful. We'll have to call a lot of people. You know, just as you call one person, you have to call another. Or they'll take offense. Right. What about without guests? Clara was perplexed. When my mother, my daughter, got married, there were 80 people at the wedding. It was a lot of fun. And where's the car now? Mom. Stephen asked this question in such a tone that Slaga got cold inside. The guy noticed that the pensioner changed her face and softened her tone. You see, it's not about fun. It's just a matter of why feed a crowd of people. Why spend money that could be put aside for something worthwhile? Like a down payment on a mortgage or a new car. Nowadays weddings are not justified. Gifts are given cheap just to present. And what's the tenth thing? Yes, Grandma Molly has entered the conversation. We can go out to a restaurant. You're Stephen's mom and maybe a few friends. There's no need for a restaurant. Her fiancé interrupted. You're a great cook. We'll set the table at home and sit down. He said it in such a tone that no one dared to argue. Well, home is home. True, Stephen didn't even offer to take care of the groceries. And there was a lot to buy for the holiday table. Shining with happiness, Molly told her friend about the upcoming event. Are you and Kevin invited? Are we going to celebrate at our house? She said, handing Nancy a small invitation card. Why not at a restaurant? Nancy wondered. Stephen thinks it's a waste of money. We can save money. I'll cook it myself. You've got a wedding and you're going shopping. Standing at the stove for two days, and by the time everyone's raised their glasses and shouted bitter you'll look like a squeezed lemon. I don't think so. And yes, about the raising of glasses, Stephen doesn't drink. My grandmother and I, you know, don't drink either. So we've decided there will be no alcohol, not even champagne. My friend's eyes went wide. Stephen said that if anyone wanted to drink to our happy married life, they could bring alcohol with them. Nancy couldn't find the words. It seemed to her that this was not a wedding, but some kind of negotiation between two parties making a deal. But since her friend and her fiancé had decided so, she wouldn't argue. It's not right though. It's not human. Did you even look at your wedding dress? She didn't know what to expect from her friend, who was going to save money on the main event in her life. The only thing I looked at wasn't the dress, it was a doomed suit in a very beautiful, soft blue color. I can wear it a few more times, and the dress will be dusty in the closet, or I'll have to sell it. Yes, Molly, your case is clinical, but it's up to you. Nancy's position on male-female relationships was firm. In couples like the one she had with Kevin, it is usually said that the father works and the mother is beautiful. What does it mean that a woman doesn't have to provide for her family? It's enough that she graces the man's life with her presence. No, of course, no one forbids to work, but in their own pleasure and not to the detriment of their favorite. And the husband must earn, 
bring to the house not only mammoth in the form of products, but sometimes in get for the wife jewelry trip to the sea different bonuses in the form of outings to restaurants. After work Molly ran to her parents' apartment. Grandmother asked the tenants to come in to pick up the money for the next month. Returning home, she heard the phone ringing in her purse. It was Stephen. They exchanged the usual sentences. The guy complained that he was very busy at work, so he wouldn't be able to help the bride with grocery shopping. And she told him that the tenants were renovating her apartment. Can you imagine? I came, and they are tearing off the old wallpaper. They said they wanted to do some cosmetic repairs. They have a baby on the way. That's good, Stephen replied. At least you and I won't have to clean it up when we move in. Otherwise, we have to spend money on wallpaper and other materials. It's embarrassing. People do things for themselves. They spend money, and we spend it on the street. Maybe we'll stay at grandma's for a while. What are you talking about? Stephen was indignant. A family should live separately, not under the supervision of the older generation. Neighborhood with relatives is not good for anyone. Believe me, Molly thought for a moment. She was uncomfortable in front of the people who had been renting her apartment for a year, making plans. Molly hadn't even hinted to them that she was going to get married soon and probably live in her parents' apartment. And now they had to deal with the situation. Two months later, they registered the marriage. The wedding was modest, but Molly did not dwell on it. A whole week, she and her grandmother went shopping, bought food for the festive table. The girl even had to take a vacation at her own expense to prepare everything properly. The owner of the salon, Adriana, did not like it. You bet, because to Molly, signed up for a manicure in advance and now had to postpone and even cancel the appointment of clients. But what can you do? The girl has a wedding. Once married, the young people began to live in Molly's apartment. Two rooms were enough. In the small one, they arranged a bedroom and in the big room, they hung a large flat screen TV and put a new sofa, which they bought with gift money. Family life began. Actually, Molly thought that after the wedding, she and Stephen would spend at least a couple of weeks together, go somewhere to rest and organize something like a honeymoon. But the husband was against it. No time to relax. You have to work and earn money to buy a bigger apartment or even a house. You want us to have kids, don't you? Of course I do. Molly imagined how happy they would be with a daughter and a son running around the rooms. Here, where are we gonna put them in two rooms? We need everyone to have their own corner, not the right hand of everyone in a small apartment. Everything her husband said seemed right to Molly. But she did not leave a strange feeling, as if they were not creating a happy family, and realize a business project. Stephen was constantly calculating, calculating, puzzling. From the very first days of their life together, he explained to Molly what a family budget is. My salary is bigger than yours, so I'll save it in a bank account and we'll live on yours. It's not gonna be enough for anything else anyway. Yeah, I make a good living, Molly said in her defense. Don't argue. I know better. Do you know how much a car costs now? And when the kids come along, it's going to be a pain in the ass. Molly imagined Stephen taking her and the children in his own car to the countryside. It would be wonderful to spend time together in the fresh air. Stephen, as always, is right about saving money. Molly wasn't exactly wasteful before. Now she's learned to save money. She stopped buying herself new things. Groceries were cheaper. She'd almost given up cosmetics altogether. Stephen always said she was beautiful as she was and plaster only ruins her skin. That's why women then have to spend money on plastic surgery. Molly had already spent very little of her own money, but her paycheck alone was still not enough. The money would run out a week before the next paycheck came in. Every time she started to mention this to her husband, he would change in his face. I don't understand where you spend the money. The man started to get agitated. We are with you, true thought and oysters do not eat and restaurants do not go, and money all the time there is no. Groceries are expensive. Plus, I have to pay the rent every month. And then my boots broke. I had to buy new ones. You could have had them repaired five times over. 
It would have been cheaper. Stephen raised his voice. Molly was silent, lowered her head. The man suddenly came to her, put his arm around her shoulders. But don't be offended, don't be afraid. I just want us to have everything in the future. And if we do not think about it now, then we will live in an old apartment and without a car. And you get more clients. Then we'll have enough to live on. I'm saving my paycheck. Molly never saw or knew how much her husband was saving. Stephen taught her to save on everything, telling her about his stable and trouble-free future, except he wasn't going to save on himself. At lunchtime, the man went to a restaurant, not to a canteen or cafe. As many other employees, he often took a cab home. And when Molly arrived with two bags of groceries in a car with checkers, he scolded and told her off. Are you crazy? You could take the bus back and forth too and from work for a week on that money. So the bags are heavy. Stephen made excuses for Molly. So what? So they're heavy. It's not like you're carrying them. You could have gotten on the bus and carried your bags. Molly suddenly got angry. You know what, Stephen? Then we'll go to the market and the grocery store together on the weekends to buy groceries for the week. I'm tired of carrying these bags. My arms were shaking with fatigue for an hour afterward, and my back still hurts. But no way, my weekends are restful. I have to work hard to provide for our family. So you can't touch my weekends. I have a legal right to lie on the couch, not run around the city with bags. That was the first time they ever fought. Molly realized that gradually all the domestic problems were being dumped on her head. Stephen did not become a support, although no one who knew him could say anything bad about him. Neighbors greeted him, politely paid him back. Wow, what kind of husband did Molly find? Always nice and sober. You can tell he's loaded. And her father was a real alcoholic. The neighbors were talking among themselves on the bench at the entrance. Molly and Stephen didn't really know anyone though. They visited Nancy and Kevin once in a while. Sometimes, they came to their house. Stephen didn't like that sort of thing. If you go out, you have to buy a cake at least. And that's a waste of money. If you invite them back to your place, you'll have to buy them food. Why would we do that? We're fine alone, he told Molly. So it was hard to argue. One day at work, Nancy asked Molly if you were going to have a party this weekend. What was the occasion? I don't get it, Molly. How don't you know? Blowing her eyes out at Nancy's friend Stephen, yours has successfully completed his probationary period and is now deputy director of the firm. Kevin told me yesterday, that's what I'm thinking. It's a great excuse to get together and celebrate. You know, Nancy, that Stephen's not a big fan of this sort of thing, right? Says Molly. She wondered why her husband hadn't told her. Listen, is his salary going to be bigger now? Why? He already got 50% more for last month, which was a probationary period. We're the ones Kevin was bragging about. Molly's throat felt cold inside, and an unpleasant lump came up. Her eyes darkened for a moment. She leaned back in her chair. Are you sick, girlfriend? Nancy was worried. Come and sit down. The girl sat Molly down on the chair, waved a magazine in front of her face to help Molly come to her senses. Why? Am I the only one who told you everything? I'm always minding my own business. I was grumbling to myself, Nancy. It's not about you, Molly said quietly. It's about me being pregnant. Oh, really? Agged her friend, stopping waving the magazine at this news. Does he know? No, not yet. I was gonna tell them today. Nancy's joyful surprise was suddenly replaced by thoughtfulness. She sat down next to Molly. Isn't it a bit early for you to have kids? Everyone's trying to get on their feet before they have kids. What are you talking about, Nancy? Children do not come from a purse with money, but from love. I really want my son to be as pretty as my little brother. I wish you were here right now. Oh, Molly, I don't think yours is going to like this news very much. I remember him talking about building a house, a car, buying the world on trips abroad, and then having children. In the evening after dinner, Molly decided to share with her husband the main news, Stephen, we will have a baby, she said, 
pressing herself against her husband, who sprawled on the sofa, watching TV. What did not immediately understand the meaning of what Stephen said? I'm saying I'm pregnant, Molly repeated. The baby will be a daughter or a son. The man turned to Molly, looked at her carefully. For a minute or two, the husband was silent. Molly even began to worry. And then he smiled and said great news. I didn't think it would happen so soon, but maybe it's for the best. Of course it's for the best. Children are the joy of a family. Listen, Molly Stevens got his wife a little too close to him. How often do women have twins? I don't know. I mean, what are the odds of us having twins? The man's eyes glistened like he found a treasure. Actually, it depends on the stereotype. Those who have twins in their family have twins. And you had what? Molly. Twins, I'm asking. Did you have twins in your family? Molly sensed an abnormal excitement in her husband's voice. Not really, she answered uncertainly. We didn't seem to have any either. Oh, shit, he thought. And then he said, it's just that if twins were born, we could get maternity capital right away. We need money for a new house. Molly looked at her husband in surprise. She didn't even think about it. Molly was more concerned with the fact of pregnancy. You're funny. I should have just one baby and raise it. And you're having twins. She poked him in the forehead with the palm of her hand. I'm not funny. I'm rational. Why? To go to the maternity hospital twice, when you can shoot off at once. Stephen frowned. Oh well, we'll have this one. And then with the second one we will not hesitate. We should not miss such an opportunity. Since the state began to pay money for the second child. That night Stephen was especially tender with Molly. She felt happy. Children change a lot of things in a family. So with the birth of their first child, petty disagreements and misunderstandings would disappear. That night, she forgot to ask her husband about his new job and a raise. And she went home determined to ask him to allocate some amount of money for the household. It's time for Molly to update her closet. By fall, she needed new shoes and a new coat. The first few months of pregnancy, Molly was on wings. She felt like she had more energy. There was a lot of busy female clients at work. When they found out that Molly was pregnant, women congratulated her. And the owner of the salon, Adriana, also congratulated her. True, added only who will now work. But you do not worry, Adriana. To you in your salon, anyone will gladly go to work. Molly tried to calm her down. I don't need any more Azinico. I need a professional and that the level is not lower than yours, and our clients love you too much, and I'm not going to be on maternity leave for long. I think I'm gonna get a job pretty soon. I have a grandmother. She'll take care of the baby. That would be really nice. Molly, very. And in the second half of the pregnancy, things started to go wrong. Molly began to gain weight, needed new comfortable clothes and shoes, but her husband was in no hurry to dress her. Where do you have to go? He would go to work, he said. And there you sit at your table, no one to show off in front of. I just don't fit into old clothes. I don't feel comfortable in them. Soon, there won't be anything left to wear. We can't spend the money I'm saving now. You're earning money, so buy your own. Molly was upset. Just today, on her way home from work, she had spent everything she had left in her purse. But her husband was adamant. In order not to cause a scandal, Molly borrowed money from Nancy and bought herself a jacket the next day. Two sizes too big. Then I'll be able to walk in the woods all the way to spring, even when my belly gets really big, she decided. Although the jacket was not fashionable and did not suit her at all, her friend only shook her head. I don't understand why Stephen won't give you money. I saw him yesterday. He came into the restaurant at lunchtime. Nancy resented him. He's got money for a good meal, but not for new clothes for his wife. Especially when you're carrying a baby under your heart. I wish I had a Kevin. Molly was tired of listening. How thoughtful Kevin is. That he spared no expense for his beautiful wife, buying her gold jewelry. And recently, she wanted a mink coat. And he, without hesitation, 
bought her a gorgeous app, Molly, Aka Stephen from the already stingy and men turned into a real miser. Whatever she asked him for money for, Molly, he'd always refuse, saying it wasn't the time to splurge. And the last time his wife showed him a prescription from the gynecologist, he threw a tantrum and left, slamming the door. And all Molly needed to do was buy vitamins. Low hemoglobin. Adriana, the owner of the beauty parlor, began to point out Molly's appearance more and more often. She didn't like the look of an employee who took in rich clients. Have you seen our sign? It says beauty and beauty parlor. You see, everything from the decor to the employees has to breathe beauty. Everything here should be pleasing to the eye. Well, you tell me who's gonna come here if I have employees who look more like scarecrows than masters of active service. Clean yourself up, Molly. Otherwise, Nancy has also openly told a friend on more than one occasion that there is whispering in the salon. Rumor has it that Adriana wants to fire Molly, and the main reason is that she's not appropriate for the beauty salon view. Nancy has bailed Molly out time and time again with money. The girl tried to find something not too expensive, but decent. It was very difficult to do that. And when Stephen saw a new blouse on her, which went very well to his wife's eyes, and covered her growing belly. Again, he made a scandal. I work like an ox. I work without a break, like a hard laborer, to make sure we have a good life. And you spend money left and right. You want vitamins. You want new clothes. If I'd known you were such a heel, I'd have thought 100 times about marrying you. Her husband's words hurt Molly. She didn't understand why she had to dress like Anish. Molly hadn't had her hair done for a long time because she didn't have enough money for it. She just ordered her hair at the back of her head to keep it out of the way. They had been living together for over a year now, and she still didn't have anything in her closet to brag about not a single decent new piece. Molly had not told her grandmother or Nancy how they had celebrated their wedding anniversary. She was very embarrassed. Honey, do you remember that next weekend is our first wedding anniversary? Molly asked Stephen at dinner. Yes. Wow, time has flown by, he replied, pulling away from the cutlet. And how are we going to celebrate our first holiday together? Maybe we could go out together, like to a restaurant. Molly, you know I don't like that kind of thing. Restaurant food is very expensive, and we have to save money. Molly thought that they don't save money on themselves. The catered lunches are not the most upscale but she decided to be persistent. She even made a resentful face. If you don't want to go to a restaurant, let's have dinner at home with your mom, my grandma Nancy. With Kevin, we could set a nice table and celebrate. Stephen disliked the idea of feeding guests at his own expense, even more than going to a restaurant. He thought about how much a dinner party would cost and decided to give up, choosing the lesser of two evils. Let's make a deal, he said to Molly. We'll go to the restaurant together. After all, it's not good to miss our first family holiday, but everyone will pay for himself. Molly looked at her husband with surprise mixed with shock. But that I don't eat enough. And you're now as out of breath, sweeping everything off the table. It's not my fault that you eat a lot, so you pay for what you order in the restaurant. Molly didn't know what to say to such a suggestion, but she was so tired of being only at work and at home that she agreed. Molly called her grandmother and asked to borrow money until payday. But she said, sure, I'll give you the money, but not as a loan. It'll be my gift to you. For your first wedding anniversary, you buy yourself something dressy. Got it. Molly promised that she would spend the money her grandmother had given her on herself and not on groceries for her husband. She didn't bother to say they were going to a restaurant, but they would each pay for themselves. Grandma just wouldn't understand such an act from her husband on a sunny spring day. Molly and Stephen had a daughter, Adriana. The girl couldn't help but stare at the baby girl. The tiny newborn girl with blue eyes greedily sucked on the breast. Hungry, my baby. Eat, you'll be big and smart. Molly herself contented herself with what was given in the hospital canteen. The food left much to be desired, but she had to eat everything so that her milk would not be lost. 
Stephen came under the windows of the hospital the day after the birth, asking to see the baby. It seemed that he was not content to be the father of a daughter. Stephen had dreamed of a son, but he and Molly did not know until the last minute who would be born. At the checkup, it wasn't obvious. He said it was easier with boys, and they didn't have to spend a lot of money on outfits. They bought a couple jeans and t-shirts, and that was it. And Molly was happy about her daughter. Looking at the baby, she thought that very soon she would dress her up in pretty dresses and tie bows. However, she and her son would be glad no less. The main thing is that the child is healthy, eats well, and sleeps a lot. While Molly was standing at the window, showing her husband the baby, a nurse came into the room. She brought in a handout from Stephen. Molly put the girl down, opened the package. She was so hungry for something meaty. But her husband gave her oranges and apples. When the nurse saw the package, she shook her head. Who carries such fruit to nursing mothers? Apples would make the baby sick, and oranges would make her allergic. God forbid. Molly found in the bag. Also, two bottles decided she was drinking tea. Soon, they will be discharged with Adriana. At home, she will make herself a normal hearty and calorie for food. On the appointed day, Molly was getting ready for discharge. She couldn't wait to let her husband hold the baby. He will take her in his arms and realize that she is a real treasure. The girl thought, looking at her daughter, who was wrapped in a beautiful blanket by the nurse. After learning that her granddaughter had given birth to a girl, she rushed to the store to buy a dowry. And by the time she was discharged, she gave Lenashka a blanket and a cute hat so that the baby would be packed properly. At home, everyone looked at everything. Adriana, the girl was sleeping peacefully in the crib. Stephen's mother looked for familiar features. Well, she didn't look anything like little Stephen. He was dark, and she was quite light, blue-eyed. The baby looks like herself. Clara interrupted her. If everyone looked like their fathers, there would be clones of them all over the world. They say the children from the parting of the reconciliation, Molly added. At first they may resemble their mom, but when they grow up they become like their dad or even go to their grandmother. I don't know when, where I was born. All around just said that he looks like his father, sparkled, mother-in-law Molly. And Stephen was like he didn't care at all. He carried the little girl around the room in his arms for a while and then gave her to her mother. She's still a baby. What would he do with her? Stephen didn't get any more generous with the birth of his daughter. He still skimped on every little thing. Molly received child benefit, but it was woefully inadequate. Every time she asked her husband for money, he became more and more angry. He was also unhappy that the baby cried at night. I have to work in the morning. I'll calm her down, he hissed. He was sleeping through his sleep on Molly not letting her sleep properly, and Adriana started teething. The girl became restless, ate poorly, and slept little. She only calmed down on walks. That's why Molly tried to walk outside with a stroller. Grandma, stay here with Adriana. I'll run to the store, Molly asked Clara. She ran to get some formula milk. There wasn't enough milk. The poor nutrition was taking its toll. The grandmother saw it all. Pitying her granddaughter, she advised her more than once to leave, Deary, to live as a nurse. What can't we do? She brought you up alone and raised you on your feet, and here you and I are going to raise a little girl alone. It's not good to leave your daughter without a father. Maybe things will get better, Molly said with a hope that was fading by the day. Grandmother was the only support for the young mother. Despite her frequent bad health, she would go to Molly to help with the baby and sometimes even gave her a chance to sleep. Seeing that Molly was getting very tired, her husband didn't help at all. He was often late at work, and lately he suddenly had some business trips. One day he left for a few days, and without even coming home. Right from work, I'm leaving for a few days on a business trip. That's all Stephen said on the phone. For how long? Molly asked. No, just for a week. What about Adriana and me alone? Tell your grandmother to come and help you. Stephen, I don't have any money. I have to buy diapers and formula for the baby. 
Molly knew he was gonna start telling her that she was feeding her daughter, that she changed her diapers too often. And in general, when he was a baby, no diapers were not bought. Somehow we did without. But my husband for the first time in many months did not scream and did not begin to reproach Molly for wastefulness. I left some money on the shelf in the hallway for you to buy what you need. Come back soon. That's all Molly had time to say. Stephen had already hung up the phone, looking at the few bills her husband had left for her and her daughter. Molly wondered how to spend them properly. She would have a whole week to get by on those pennies. She'd have a whole week to get by on those pennies. Molly called her grandmother, wanting to invite her to stay with her for the time Stephen would be away. I'm sick, Molly replied in a weak voice. What's wrong with you? It is known that the pressure. Yesterday a neighbor called an ambulance. They gave me a shot. They wanted to take me to the hospital. I refused. How can I leave you, Adriana? I'll lie down for a while and come back. Stephen's away on a business trip, and I wanted you to stay with me for a week. I'd like to keep an eye on you. Come on, Vanya. You'd have to deal with Adriana on your own. And now you have to take care of me, a sick old woman. Molly was worried about her grandmother. Her blood pressure had been spiking a lot lately, and the old meds weren't working. I had to go to the district therapist, but grandma couldn't do it alone, and Molly had no time at all. She'd follow up for a few days and get back on her feet. As long as I'm alive, I won't leave Molly. She thought and went to see her granddaughter and great-granddaughter. As long as Molly's alive, I won't give up, she thought. And she walked to her granddaughter and her great-granddaughter. Carrying in a bag of simple groceries, grandmother knew at home Molly's refrigerator was almost always empty. How can Stephen not see that you sit here hungry all day long? Where would he put the money? She resented him, putting on the table cereals, sausage, a loaf of fresh wheat bread. He wants to build a big house so that we can live in it and raise our children. I see what kind of educator he is. He hardly ever comes near his daughter. He's so tired. Grandma justified her husband. Molly works a lot. No, not the kind of husband you need. Grandma shook her head. Where did my eyes go? When I blessed you with this marriage, Grandma. But Stephen doesn't drink or beat me. It was the argument Molly always used to soothe herself in moments of resentment toward Stephen. In her memory, there were memories of her drunken father chasing her mother around the apartment, how he beat her severely, and she hid in a small room with a chip. That's how it is Molly's mom and little brother never knew one never went hungry. The father gave money, leaving himself only enough to drink, but the mother suffered from beatings all the time. And Molly knew from childhood that a drunk man was dangerous. You have to stay away. Stephen, on the other hand, doesn't take a drop in his mouth. Not even on holidays. But he was a hammer. Like nothing I've ever seen before. What's true is true. Your Stephen doesn't drink. And that's good. Clara rocked Adriana in her arms. You'd think with a life like that what's better. What are you saying, Grandma? Molly was indignant at Clara's words. If Daddy hadn't drunk, hadn't hurt Mommy, we'd all be together now. I never would have lost my baby brother. I loved Robert so much. I still have that picture. The girl went to the shelf, where in a simple plastic frame stood the photograph that her grandmother had found in a letter from her daughter. Molly looked sadly at her mother and little Robert on her lap. What was wrong with them now? Are they alive? What if they are in need? What if they're starving? But don't think about that. Her grandmother interrupted her. Your mother, if she's alive, won't be lost. And she certainly won't make Robert starve. It's just not time. It's not time yet. For what? She was silent. And then reached into Adriana Molly's neck to put her in her crib. Her husband returned from his business trip in a surprisingly good mood. He played with Adriana while Molly sorted through the gift bags. There were baby things, even a paycheck, and some groceries, obviously not from their neighborhood store. Stephen, what a beautiful dress. It's a little big though, but my daughter is growing up fast. Soon she'll be able to wear it. Yes, I picked it out myself. My husband said proudly, it's expensive. 
but it's for my daughter. There and look at the toys for her, funny. She took out animals, rattles, letters on the magnetic ABCs, then why should she still to learn letters to grow and grow? Molly will grow up, and we won't even know she's grown up. Stephen smiled, and Molly rejoiced. She hadn't seen her husband in such a good mood in a long time. And then everything goes up in price. We have to stock up. I went to the bakery and bread is too are more expensive again. Should we buy a bag of flour? You're gonna bake it yourself in the oven. Everything's cheaper. I don't have time to bake. I'm with the baby all the time. Grandma will help, said Stephen. By the way, you had her. She helped, but she's very sick. Stephen seems to have missed those words. Let's get your daughter ready. I'll take her for a walk in the yard. Meanwhile, you cook something special for dinner. You got groceries. I got a whole bag of groceries. Molly was pleased. Stephen was generally reluctant to take care of Adriana. He was going for a walk with his daughter. She quickly dressed the baby, came down the stairs following her husband, who rolled out the stroller. Everything will get better. We'll live like people, she thought, looking out the window as her husband and daughter walked along the fictitious tile path. Molly picked up her cell phone, swiped her finger across the screen to look up dinner ideas online on social media. On her page, she saw photos sent in. The picture showed a smiling Stephen in swim trunks and a girl in a bright pink swimsuit. They were standing under a palm tree on a beach with golden sand. Molly's heart raced. What did that mean? Her husband wasn't on any business trip, but was vacationing at a resort. And who is this girl? A casual acquaintance. Or was he vacationing with her? A mistress. When her husband and daughter returned from their walk, Molly undressed the little girl and began to set the table. She didn't know how to bring up the fact that an explicit picture had appeared on her page. Molly set the table, seated her daughter next to a tall high chair for feeding. Satisfied her husband flew away from the beer and mashed potatoes. Oh, and I missed home-cooked meals. Stephen really hardly ever ate at home more often at restaurants. He said he'd starve to death before he got home, so he had to eat in cafes. Do you know what this is? Molly asked, pointing to the photo on her phone. Stephen silently, Stephen silently stared, and the girl waited for him to start explaining. But the husband didn't even think of embarrassing himself or making excuses. Wow, that really came out well. He asked his wife. Where are you? And who are you with? Asked Molly. What's your business? Yeah, I went on vacation. Stephen jumped up from the table. His voice became cold again. You know why? Because I need a vacation. I work hard to earn money for us to live a normal life. I work like an ox, so that you do not need anything in the future. I save on everything. I can afford a vacation once in a while. You don't work hard. You stay at home all day. I'm with our baby. So I don't work. Molly tried to justify herself. There's no reason to cover for a baby mommy's been sending her to daycare for a year and a half, or let the grandmother sit with her. Am I the only one who doesn't feed you with your appetites? No, look at you. I work every day, earn money, and she finds time to sit on social networks and follow me. Molly did not have time to say that she was not following her husband, that the photo was sent to her and someone unknown but he had already slammed the door and shouted I'm going for a walk. I've ruined it again. The evening was off to such a good start. Molly thought as she cleared the dirty dishes from the table, she decided that tomorrow she would go to the beauty parlor to find out about the maternity leave. I don't have any vacancies at all. Indifferently, looking at the former employee, who was the best master of active service a year and a half ago, said Adriana, I have nowhere to take you. Molly, maybe just for a few hours. I had my own clients. I could work with them. That's completely impossible. The boss disapprovingly looked at the girl's old suit and also noticed the lack of good makeup and dull complexion. I was gonna call you myself to give you a letter of resignation. I don't need employees with small children. Babies get sick a lot. On her way out of the salon, Molly ran into an old friend, Nancy. Mother, why are you here? 
She was surprised. Yes, I wanted to go back to work. Suggested I quit my job altogether. Soon the nannies will stop paying the allowance. Without money, it's going to be very hard. And I thought you didn't need money, said Nancy. Light a thin cigarette. My Kevin said Stephen just bought a trip to Turkey last month. You, girlfriend, you don't look at all. Like just that soon. Molly did not tell Nancy that her husband did not go on vacation with her, that she still needed money. And now she had lost her job, which used to bring her a good income. In the evening, Stephen asked Molly if she had gone to the salon. She had, she said as she poured tea for her husband. When you go to work, they won't take me. They offered to quit, the wife replied sadly. Well, here we are Stephen threw a spoon on the table. Are you going to sit on my neck until retirement? I feed you, I clothe you, I pay the rent. It's all out of my pocket. It's not a long way to go with you. How much do you spend on us? Molly tried to argue. You count your own. Don't mess with my wallet. I have everything thought out in my life. Everything will go to work. I am trying, beating, to build my own house, to rest at resorts, a car to buy, in general, so, as you want to get out of it, take a job at home, and adds what do you do? A manicure at home is enough at the end of the day. I'm sick of your freeloaders. Everything Stephen said was hurtful to Molly. She was ready to cry from hopelessness, from self-pity. But suddenly her cell phone rang. Molly excited voice spoke neighbor. Hurry up and come to your grandmother in the ambulance to the hospital. Molly quickly dressed on the go, explaining to her husband that she had to go to the hospital. She put her daughter on his lap and ran out the door. She got home a couple hours later. Grandma had died, Molly said quietly, forestalling her husband's questions with a heart attack. After the funeral, Molly sat at the kitchen window, watching the sun sink behind the trees. She had lost the last person close to her. Her husband never became her family and lately he had become distant. He was always away on business trips. On the one hand, the girl was calmer when he was not at home. On the other hand, she had no money for food. If Stephen did not go anywhere, then at least bought food, from which Molly cooked food. He was not going to starve himself. Six months later, Molly took over the inheritance. She inherited the apartment. Stephen rubbed his hands together, looking at the inheritance certificate. You know what I've decided? Molly said, he put his arm around his wife. We'll sell your apartments and start building a house. I've already looked at a plot of land outside the city, but it's quiet and the air is fresh. Molly imagined a beautiful big house with an adjoining territory where there would be a playground for Adriana and a lot of flowers. But where would we live while the house was being built? She worried, maybe we shouldn't sell a house. You've been saving almost your entire paycheck to start construction. How many times have I told you to stay out of my wallet? The money I'm saving, we're gonna need for the house. We'll need to buy furniture. And to live in the country, we need a car. Besides, it's my money. I earned it with my own labor. Shouldn't you be contributing to the house? Molly sighed heavily. She was not ready to lose her parents and grandmother's apartment overnight. Seeing his wife's doubt, Stephen changed his tone. Don't worry, we'll rent a spacious apartment for the construction period and live there for a while. But in a year, we'll move into a new house. Can you imagine how nice it'll be for our daughter? Her own yard, and she'll have her own room. Stephen always knew just what to push. Molly would do anything if her daughter's well-being depended on it. They sold the apartment quickly. But on Molly housing, inherited from her parents, the buyer was not found for a long time. Molly did not see the money from the sale of her grandmother's apartment. Her husband said that he put them in his account, and from there they will go to pay for the construction of the house. One evening, Stephen took a suitcase out of the pantry and started packing. Where are you going? Molly asked in a whisper. The daughter and the girl were asleep in the room. I was afraid to wake her up. I'm going on a business trip for a long time. A week and a half. The bosses are sending me. I see. Molly thought her husband needed another vacation, but she didn't want to get into a fight. 
he'd come back anyway. After such business trips, he became kind, attentive, even caring for a few days. At least leave us some money, we're running low on groceries. I also ran out of money for cell phones. Stephen V. took it and frowned. He seemed to be calculating something in his mind. I don't have any extra money. It's all set aside for construction. Get a job. How many times do I have to tell you? You don't even need money for a cell phone. Why don't you stop surfing social media and stalking me? But how would I be able to call you if I did? Molly got worried. You don't have to call me when I'm on a business trip. I'll call you myself. And incoming calls on your tariff are free. Alone at home, Molly thought about how to earn money. She took a notebook in a cell and a pen and wrote a handwritten advertisement for an active service master. At the end, she included her phone number. While Adriana slept, Molly went downstairs and posted the papers on the entryway doors of her house. When she returned, she retrieved her tools from her room. Orange sticks, cheeses, manicure bit scissors, tweezers to provide a minimal service. That's enough. And there were very few nail polishes left. Some were shoved in altogether and went to the trash can. But that's okay. We'll last a few days. And then maybe someone will apply for an ad. Molly hoped, but no one called tomorrow or the day after. Standing at the windowsill, she watered the indoor plants she had brought from her grandmother's apartment. The flowers had time to wilt, but care and care did their job. Fresh leaves appeared. Only plants can live on water alone. What about Adriana and me? Molly thought. The water in the small watering can she use to water the flowers. The flowers had run out. Molly moved the flower pot to the coffee table and went into the bathroom to put the container under the sink. Adriana was playing with toys on the floor. Suddenly, Molly heard a loud wheezing sound. She ran into the room. Her daughter was lying on the floor wheezing. She was desperately gasping for breath. Her body had become absorbent cotton. Molly grabbed the phone in a panic, started dialing the number of the ambulance. The girl remembered that she had no money on her phone, so she would not be able to call the doctors, not knowing what to do. The girl grabbed the panting rod in her arms, ran out of the apartment without even getting dressed, and quickly went downstairs. She ran out to help, saw a car stopped in front of her driveway. Please help, Molly screamed. My daughter is suffocating. The driver jumped out of the car. He was a young, well-dressed guy in his 20s. What's wrong with her? I don't know. She's choking, Molly screamed. Get in quickly, said the guy and opened the back door of the car. Tell me where to go. I'm not from around here. Molly was pointing the way to the hospital, but she was just praying that she could get the girl there in time. Adriana had stopped squeaking, barely breathing. My little one, now be patient. We'll be there in time to help you. The car stopped at the steps of the emergency room. The guy opened the car door, took the girl Molly from his arms. Where to? He asked, and he was already hurrying to the front door. Molly rushed after him. Help, the baby's sick. My daughter is choking, Molly shouted for help. Within seconds, the girl was placed on a gurney and wheeled away. Molly and the strange guy were left alone in an empty room. The girl was in a state of shock and didn't notice that there was someone else next to her. She sat down on a chair against the wall, covered her face with her hands and cried quietly. Calm down, everything will be all right. The unfamiliar man put his arm around her shoulders. Only now did she begin to perceive what was happening realistically. He had helped her without even asking what had happened. He helped her without asking too much. The girl looked at the stranger with gratitude. Thank you, she said. There's no reason not to thank. The guy replied, and you're all shivering. He took off his outer garment and carefully covered Molly's shoulders. For a while they sat in silence. Molly couldn't understand what had happened to her daughter. All day she had been calm, playing with her toys. There was no sign of a cold. She didn't complain of a tummy ache. Suddenly, there's this terrible wheeze. How old is your girl? Unexpectedly asked the guy, immersed in his thoughts. Molly completely forgot about him. 
One year and nine months, she answered. Why didn't you leave? Thank you so much for helping me. But you should probably get on with your business. She started to pull off the stranger's jacket, but he put it back on her shoulders with a warning movement. Don't worry, I'm in no hurry at all. In fact, it's important that I know what's going on with your baby. I'm kind of in charge of her now. I'll be honest, I was really scared for the girl, and for you. You had that look. The guy gave Molly his hand. I'm Robert. Molly, Molly smiled faintly and held out her hand. His palm was warm. The light shake cheered the girl up. I was really, really scared. Adriana is my only and favorite daughter. I don't know what will happen to me if something happens to her. She'll be fine. There's doctors here. They're gonna help. Robert tried to reassure her. Thank you. Molly looked into his eyes. They were the same sky blue color as her daughter's. Are you the girl's parents? The doctor asked. He looked about 40 years old. Molly stood up unable to even ask what was wrong with Adriana. Silently, she looked at the doctor. Yes, we brought her here, answered Robert instead of the girl. And it's good that we brought her ourselves. They were waiting for an ambulance. I'm afraid we wouldn't have been able to save her in time. Molly felt the doctor's words making her legs shrink. The doctor noticed her agitation and hurried to reassure her. Everything is already fine. Don't worry so much. Your daughter had a severe allergy attack. We pumped her stomach. Apparently, the allergic shock was caused by a plant leaf she swallowed. Now we've given her a shot. She'll lie down for a while. And you can take her home. And in the future, try to keep an eye out what the child is putting in her mouth. Molly realized that Adriana had reached for the flower she had left on the coffee table. I'll throw it away. As soon as I get home, Molly thought to herself. For two hours she sat in the emergency room, and the guy who had helped her out in a dangerous moment was there when Adriana was carried out by a nurse. Molly jumped up from her chair, rushed to hug the little girl, but she only flapped her eyes. Tears sprang from the mother's eyes. Her Adriana is alive. She's all right now. Robert drove them home, stopped the car in front of the driveway. I don't know how to thank you, Molly said. And you can make me some tea, he said, smiling. I'm craving something hot. Well, let's go. Molly headed for the entryway, thinking that she had nothing for tea. At least there was some brew in the tin. Come in. Invited the girl Robert, pushed open the front door. In her haste, she had left it unlocked. The guest, undressed, went into the room, looking at the furnishings in the car. Adriana had fallen asleep. Apparently that was the effect of the medication she had been given at the hospital. Molly tiptoed into the bedroom, put her to bed, and returned to Robert. I'll put the kettle on now. The boy nodded in response. She returned to the room a few minutes later, carrying two cups of tea and sugar on a tray. On the bottom that still had a little sweetening left for. You'll have to excuse me. I have nothing to treat you to guiltily, she pronounced, and set the tray on the table. That's okay. And let's use your first name, Robert suggested. After all, today we saved a child. And such feats should bring us closer together. She really felt that this guy she didn't know had become very close to her in a few hours. Come on, let's go, said Molly and laughed softly. Robert took a sip from his cup and looked around. Suddenly, his gaze stopped on a framed photograph that stood on the shelf next to the TV. He stood up and came closer. May I? Robert asked, pointing at the picture. Yes, of course. He sat down again, holding the framed picture of Molly, her parents, and her little brother. Is this your family? He asked. Yes, but no one is around anymore, Molly replied. Suddenly, the guy got up and went to the hallway. When he came back, he opened his wallet and took out a small photo. Look, it's me. He held out a snapshot of the girl from the picture as a child, her little brother Robert looking at her. Only he was a little older than Molly remembered him. She looked perplexed, looking at the picture and at Robert, and he was smiling. That's me. A long time ago, my mom ran abroad from this town for my dad. He threatened her with a knife. 
My mother said he drank heavily and beat her, so she had to go into hiding. Recently I turned 20 years old and my mother told me everything about her past. By then she was already sick. Oncology. Robert was quiet for a while. Molly looked at the boy in the picture and thought she was having a strange dream. She couldn't help but notice that Robert was in the family photo. And that boy is the same person. I always knew I had a grandmother, a father, and an older sister in Russia. When my mom was dying, she asked me to find my grandmother and my sister Molly. So when I buried her, I came here. Robert found grandma's house. I wanted to talk to her first, but the neighbor said that the old lady died not so long ago and the apartment is for sale. She also told me that my sister lived in my parents' old apartment. Robert continued, I knew the street name of the city and the house number by heart from childhood, but the apartment number just slipped my mind and my grandmother's neighbor didn't know it. So I decided I'd find my sister. Even if there are 1,000 apartments in this building, I got to the house and there you are, running out with your daughter in your arms. Molly looked at the guy and couldn't believe this was happening to her. Is this really her brother, Robert? It turns out it is, but it's so unbelievable, I can hardly believe it's happening. I thought they'd go door to door. And I ask people in the courtyard, and I find my sister. He looked at Molly with a look of warmth and joy, and she was completely speechless. The boy and the girl hugged tightly, two loved ones separated. Scientists for almost 20 years were close to each other again. Tears were flowing down their cheeks. They were tears of joy and happiness. The unexpected meeting completely changed Molly's life. All week her brother was close to her, not a minute away from her and her little niece. They took walks together, went shopping. Robert liked to please his sister Adriana to buy her little girl toys and beautiful things. And when they got home, they would cook dinner together. Our mother loved to cook dumplings, making so many of them that sometimes they didn't fit in the freezer. Then she would take them out on the balcony. In the wintertime, there were a few boards there. The brother and sister felt happy. Molly had forgotten that her husband would be back soon while he was away. She talked a lot about her life, about how Stephen constantly reproaches her with a piece of bread and does not give her money for groceries. The girl did not complain, but simply answered her brother's questions and constantly tried to justify her husband. You see, he is very frugal. He wants to build us a house, that's why he saved all the money. And now we've sold grandma's apartment and put it on the market. Sister, will you stay on the street with a husband like that? It was obvious to Robert that her husband was just screwing around to make a profit at her expense while he was living for his own pleasure. One day, Robert suddenly went somewhere. Will you be gone long? My sister asked. I think not, he replied, stretching his jacket. When will I be back? Let's go for a walk. The weather's great. Frost and sunshine, like Pushkin. By the time Robert returned, Molly had managed to feed and collect Adriana. They dressed warmly and went for a walk. Everyone was having fun. But Molly had one question, and she finally decided to ask her brother, are you going away? I'll be alone again. He looked at her carefully, hugged her, and said, let's talk about this a little later. Not now. Molly, Robert and Adriana returned home in the evening. They had a great time at the entertainment center, where there were rides for the kids. Then they sat in the coffee shop with the door to the hallway open. Molly saw her husband's suitcase. Stephen is back, she said. Her husband's voice came from the room. Molly, you hurry up. We have to pack. Stephen came out to meet his wife and daughter. Who's this? Meet Stephen. This is my brother, Robert. He came from out of the country to find me. I told you I had a brother, but I didn't know where he was. Robert found me. The man looked at the boy with a blank stare, as if he were nothing. Come on in, we'll be packing faster. I sold the apartment. While you're living in a communal apartment, I've rented a room there. I'll move in with my mom while our house is being built. We'll all be cramped in the communal room. Hurry up, Molly. What are you standing there for? She doesn't have to hurry. Robert suddenly entered the conversation. But you, man, 
you can go to your mother's house. Listen, you little brat, shut up and mind your own business. Stephen snapped at him, not realizing what was going on. Molly looked from her husband to her brother. Your husband sold the apartment under the power of attorney you signed. He didn't intend to build a house, and he certainly didn't have you and your daughter in his plans. I was able to find that out during my time in the city. It wasn't hard. Stephen is as naked as a falcon. He doesn't have any savings that he's been telling you about. He just wanted to get his hands on your money, just like he got his hands on the money from selling our grandmother's apartment. And the day before yesterday, I bought that apartment from the realtors, and now it's mine. The guy pulled out a piece of paper and showed it to Molly and her husband. And then Robert opened the door and put Stephen's suitcase in the stairwell. As the saying goes, where here Robert pointed the money with his hand at the door, or for the particularly uneducated, get out, or should I call the police? Stephen had no choice but to leave. Robert gave Molly the deeds to the apartment, took Adriana in his arms, hugged his sister, and said, now you and I have two homes, mine abroad and yours here. You choose where you want to live, wherever you are, smiling, the sister replied. Now she felt that everything would be fine next to her beloved younger brother.